appreciate your ministry this morning. So good to be able to come and share with you and uh, kick off our new series, Hope Now and Then. I want to talk this morning about our infinite hope from Colossians 3, verses uh, 1 to 3. Let me read that uh, to you from the New Living Translation. If you have your Bibles, please open your Bibles to that uh, text. I love this text. I love all the texts, actually. I love the Word of God. It's wonderful how God just, you know, when you come to it and you meditate upon it and you consider it, just layer upon layer of truths uh, surface and reveal. No other book is like that, actually. You, you can read a novel and you read a sentence, and the sentence means what it seeks to convey. In its first instance, you read the Bible, you keep reading it and keep reading the same text, and more and more truths seem to arise. The truth of God is unfathomable. This word is really alive and living. So this word speak to you this morning. Colossians 3, verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his uh, glory. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I read an article during the week that uh, there was an expectation that more and more people, I think primarily as a consequence of uh, COVID-19, are going to be experiencing uh, PS, what is it? Uh, PTSD. Actually, I heard Pastor Steve say that he was suffering from that this morning because uh, people were, were not moving from the foyer into the cafe to pray. We don't want to do things that give our pastor anxiety. So next week when you come to pray, everybody get into the center of things, all right? My theory is this, that you're holding back at the outer courts because of sin. Only those who are able to, who feel righteous in God are able to proceed right through into the center, into the Holy of Holies. So next week you want to come cleansed, all right? and uh, ready to pray and uh, let there be peace in our senior pastor's heart. Uh, anyway, post-traumatic stress disorder. I had a little bit of that lately myself. You know, last time I preached here, uh, you'll remember the story that just prior to the preaching, it's kind of leading up to the preaching, I think it's spiritual warfare. They tried to uh, put me in the skip when they were having a clean out of all the old things. <laughs> And uh, in the church, you know, all the rubbish in the church, you know. In fact, I did get into the skip, and they wanted just to leave me there. Apart from Pastor Dawn, who has a heart of compassion, more than the most. And so uh, that was a stressful moment for me, but I survived that one. Now leading up to this particular preach, you know, I'm always expecting the warfare. You wouldn't believe what happened. This time the senior pastor locks me in the cupboard underneath <laughs> the stairs there, where they store all the stuff that they just need to use just now and again. You know, I'm, I'm in there. I'm actually faithfully serving the church, doing something for Pastor Dawn, I think, fixing something. And I'm in the cupboard. I'm filling around. Next minute, the door shuts. And I think, how'd that door shut? And then I, it's all dark in there, you know, and I thought, I won't panic. I won't panic. Although I was thinking that, you know, I'm going to be here for about 50 years and, and, and someone will be coming in. They want to demolish the building and they'll discover me mummified, you know, in the, uh, you know, in, in the cupboard. And, and I went to push on the door, and it's not a lockable door, and the door wouldn't move. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm really stuck here. And I tried again. This time I really put my shoulder into it, bang, you know, and it moved a little bit. And then, you know, finally it opened, and then there's this sort of senior pastor outside, so I'm just going, <laughs> oh, hello, hello, Wayne. Lots of stress in this world. Lots of things coming against us. You know, I have heard. I mean, it's funny, I guess maybe it's the job that I'm in, but um, I'm hearing of so much loss <laughs> lately. Uh, this is not funny, Stan. I'm getting uh, serious now. Or, 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 just just pull, yourself, pull yourself together. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so you're still picturing me in that cupboard, aren't you? Mummified. I know. Yeah. Anyhow, where was I? Yeah, I was talking about serious stuff. A lot of loss lately. People, I'm coming across people who have lost loved ones. Uh, in fact, we've had a couple of... Uh, deaths in our own family, extended family, just, uh, you know, just recently. Losses of, uh, you know, relationships, losses of uh, around the job area. Um, yes, just all sorts of, you know, sad and awful things uh, taking place. It seems like, for me, there are avalanches of tragedy. Uh, one of the things that uh, we discovered, when you and I, just a couple of weeks ago, was that our eldest grandson, uh, Ashton, has an inoperable brain tumour. And, uh, you know, the prognosis in the natural is not particularly good 
you know, with this kind of condition. And so we are uh, looking to God for a miracle uh, around that. And uh, many of you are praying, and I really want to thank you for that. Keep, uh, you know, keep your prayers uh, going. Anyway, uh, in the light of all that, I just want to say that I am glad I'm not doing this life without Christ. Amen. I mean, that's it. You know, bottom line, I am glad that I'm not doing this life without Christ. And so many do. But to take God out of the equation, life in this world with its dichotomous mix of wonderful beauty and terrible pain, and especially because of the latter, is a mad, meaningless, disappointing, unpleasant, and confusing journey. That's, true. I mean, that's what it feels like you know, sometimes. And, and, you know, to take God right out of the equation, it is like that in reality for those people without him. They stumble through life blindfolded, as it were, without a sense of direction or any kind of understanding from God. And so life, in essence, is wasted and a soul is without hope in that kind of condition. Say it again, I'm glad I'm not going, I'm not doing this life without Christ. <laughs> J.I. Packer, one of the uh, great uh, contemporary theologians, went to be with the Lord uh, recently, writes this, the world today is full of sufferers from the wasting disease. Now, I could do with a bit of the wasting disease to get rid of the waste. <laughs> but the wasting disease he's talking about is uh, uh, a philosophy put forward by uh, a man by the name of uh, Albert uh, uh, Camas in the last uh, century who developed a worldview of thinking which he labeled absurdism, absurdism, trying to say that. Right? In other words, life is absurd. In other words, life is a joke because there's something in us that you know, desires meaning and, and, and purpose and significance. But in reality, you know, life without God doesn't offer that. So we're in this dilemma. You know, this is going on on the inside of us, but it's not happening in our reality, particularly without God. We can't find meaning or purpose or substance or significance or indeed hope in this life. And even Christians attempted to go to that particular place, you know, when things go wrong. So we're not immune from that kind of attack, you know, from the enemy. We have to uh, come against this uh, because we are not without hope and we need to be reminded of ourselves uh, of, of that hope. Hope now and then. Now for this temporal world and then for the uh, eternal world. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, we must accept finite disappointment. I mean, that's the reality in this world. But then he goes on to say, but never lose infinite hope. All right, so come to terms with the reality of disappointment in this world, but come to terms also with the reality of the infinite hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 12, verse 21 says this, His name, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, think of this, this is the scripture, this is the truth of God, His name will be the hope of all the world. Amen. And we know that hope. Now the thing is we talk much about God's purpose for our lives, don't we? It's, a, it's an important deal, particularly when you're a young person. You, you, you're wanting to know why God has you on this particular planet and you're looking for the details uh, of it. But however life plays out for all of us, let me just tell you this, that God's primary purpose is that we know Him. And our primary aim, our life's ambition should be that we know Him. You're in this world, you're in this temporal world, so that you might get to know God. That's your primary purpose. And in the process of getting to know God, you become more like Him, that you might present Him in this world, that you might present hope in a world which is without hope. This is, the, this is your primary purpose, whatever it is that you're doing. That is the underlying motivation and ambition for your life, or at least that is what God intends. And in John 17, verse 3, he said this. This is Jesus speaking. All right? This is our Lord and Savior speaking. Remember, he has the words of life. He is the word. He is life. He says, this is the way to have eternal life, to know the only true God and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. So the way to have eternal life is to know Jesus. I mean, to really know him, not to know of him, but to know him. 
That's to you know have an understanding, an intimacy of relationship. You know to perceive the things of Christ and the kingdom of heaven, to to understand those and to live according to the revelation that Christ has given to you. Because in knowing Christ, we find great hope for this life now. And eternal, infinite life for then, which is to come with all of its promise of peace and joy and the cessation of all sorrow and suffering. This is what our hope is. In verse 1 here in Colossians, it says this, Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Remember that, where Christ sits at the place of honor, at God's right hand. Now, the moment you're born again, and if you are not born again by the Spirit of Christ, by believing in Jesus, I hope you will before this day is over. <laughs> but the moment you are born again, this new life begins. It begins here in the now. Your hope begins here in the now, and it is infinite. It will transcend into the eternal destiny. But this new life, think about this new life. In this new life, one is raised into eternity as Christ was raised from the dead. There is our eternal hope. But it is also raised in the sense of participating in a far higher level of living now, which is our temporal hope. And this is what we really don't grasp and really don't understand. Because if we did understand this, our lives would be significantly far more impacting for Jesus than they currently are. This message is going to be challenging, but it will also be inspiring. Because you don't want your ears tickled. You want to be changed to become more like Christ, to fulfill His purpose and carry the hope which the world so desperately needs. And you want to be able to communicate uh, that. So, we're meant to be living at this far higher level of life. Ephesians 2.6 confirms it. He raised us from the dead. We're raised to new life. Ephesians 2.6 says, He raised us from the dead with Christ. Now, where's Christ seated? In the place of honor at God's right hand. Ephesians 2 goes on to say, And seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Now, this is an incredibly inspiring truth. If we can really get it in here and believe what it says. Where is Christ seated in the place of honor at God's right hand? And so where are we seated in the spiritual sense? With Him in the heavenly realms. So whatever the full implication of that is, we are at the very least positioned in such proximity to Christ, we have the access to all the power and authority for the will of heaven to be made manifest on earth. We are seated with him in heavenly places. That's our position. So that means we live on earth from the position of hope. Because we're in the position of being in the realm of His presence. We're literally in the realm of His presence and the reality of His purpose. See, here's the understanding of what this life is all about. And what we have in terms of being able to appropriate that life and minister that life, which is Christ and that hope. We're in the realm of His presence, the reality of His purpose, and the realization of His promises. That's a good place to be. It's a wonderful place to be. And so here's the question for you this morning. I mean, I mean, seriously consider it because we've got to take God more seriously. This is a time of awakening. I believe the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is near. I believe the preparations are being made. The world scene is being set. The harvest is yet to be reached, but the church has to awaken because what has been eradicated or eroded from this world increasingly is hope. But we have the hope. And there's an opportunity right now for us to begin to minister that hope and see His name glorified and his church built and his territory increased by serving him and by ministering in that particular uh, way so are you living at this higher level are you a hope carrier are you a hope minister you're meant to be 
Or you're one of these miserable Christians that looks like they've been sucking on lemons all day, you know, wherever you go. Here comes old sour puss Christian, you know. We've got, to, we've got to present something far different. And we've got to do it whatever the circumstances are in our life. We are meant to be overcoming Christians. Navigating the challenges we face in this world with a sense of confident hope. Or is it defeat and despair? Because I see so many Christians walking around in defeat and despair. Utter hopelessness when you're meant to be living hope. Ephesians 1 verse 3, all praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us, listen to this, with every spiritual blessing. Where? In the heavenly realms. Where are you seated? In the heavenly realms. Because we are united with Christ, there's the condition every time, being united in the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's spiritual blessings, in my mind, are inexhaustible and they are an eternal inheritance, but many are available in temporal experience for every circumstance. So as a hope carrier, this is the kind of demeanor that you are to display as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are meant to carry peace. You are meant to carry joy. You are meant to carry faith, love, forgiveness, healing, deliverance, and power over sin, victory in every trial. That's how we are to present. That's how we present hope. 1 John 5, 4, for every child of God defeats this evil world. This is our hope now in this life, to be able to live on earth as overcomers. And we don't have to contend with the struggles. And some of you are contending with struggles. Despair and grief and things coming against you. Walls that seem to be erected that, you know, that stop you enjoying the real life of, of Christ let me tell you this, you are seated in heavenly places. There's your hope with access to all the power of heaven. And you don't contend with your challenges for victory, but from victory. Because of where you are positioned. That's our position of hope. Living from heaven towards earth. From heaven towards earth. And then in verse 2, the word goes on to say, think about things of heaven, not the things of earth. While we live from heaven towards earth, we also live from earth towards heaven. John 15, verse 19, Jesus said this, you are no longer part of the world. Do you live like that? <laughs> You're no longer part of the world. You see, my thought is this, you know, I, you know, and I'm preaching to myself, you know, when I'm preaching to you. I wonder whether we are just too earthbound sometimes in our thinking. See, see, to live earthbound is to focus on the temporal without regard to eternity. What mostly occupies your thoughts, is it heaven or earth? That's a good question. What's mostly occupying your thoughts? Is it heaven or earth? Because the, the Bible says to think about the things of heaven. And the answer to that question is quite telling because in terms of where y y your heart lies, because it is evidenced then by the focus of your time and your energy and your effort and your resources. What are you giving yourself to? Is it temporal or is it eternal? Eternal. The problem with earthbound thinking is that it is intrinsically selfishly orientated. It is all to do with material accumulation, personal comfort, and selfish ambition. Too many Christians live in that place. And it's a place without hope. You may add a token of spirituality to it, but only when it is convenient or without real cost. Do you know of Christians who operate or live around the peripheries of the kingdom? Scripture can even be justified to support the stance of pursuing material blessing, but without the corresponding truths of generous stewardship and sacrifice and suffering. And this is a worldly view. This is a temporal view. This is, a, this is an earthly view. There's no hope in that view. That worldly view is a perfidious promise of perf fulfillment. And it's an exercise of futility. It's a destroyer of hope since the material may be lost and does not last. Matthew 6, 19, 20. Our Lord Jesus speaking again. Don't store up your treasures here on earth where moths and rust destroys them and where thieves break in to steal them store up your treasures in heaven Jesus says 
And again, this is what our life's ambition ought to be as well, to build for above serving Christ, his message of the infinite hope for a ruined humanity. And the hope of peace with God, of justice, of pardon, and the ultimate hope of an end to human suffering and sorrow, when everything on the day that Christ comes again will be set right. You know, there's our hope. And I tell you what, when I'm feeling the sadness and sorrow that I'm feeling for some of the people that I know and minister to and who are related to me are going through their stuff when I'm going through my own stuff, it is that hope that sustains me. It should sustain you to know that even as you face trials and tragedy, while they may at this time seem somehow destructive, God promises to turn them into something that builds for the eternal. And in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, he says, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce in us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. If you can just understand the perspective of heaven, if you can live from the position of heaven when you're going through stuff, God will give you that strength and you'll impart that hope because on the other side of all of this, there's going to be something far more wonderfully glorious than you could even ever imagine. And so we build towards heaven by presenting that hope on earth and by giving others a taste of the power and goodness of God and showing Christ's love. J.I. Packer puts it this way. I'm reading one of his books right now. He says, this is how we're meant to be living, by spending and being spent to enrich our fellow humans, giving time, effort, care, and concern to do good to others in whatever way there seems need. See, there's nothing self-centered. There's no, there's no personal ambition there in Christ's life in the way that we are to live. We're to present hope with love and faith to those who are in need. C.S. Lewis said this. He said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did most for the present were those who thought most of the next. I love it. I love Jacob's dream. Genesis 28. You know Jacob's dream? You know, he sees the, the ladder between heaven and earth and the angels ascending and descending the ladder. I was considering that. You know, he, when he wakes up from this dream, Jacob calls the place where he was camping out and where he was sleeping, he calls it Bethel, which means the house of God. And he says, this is an awesome place. <laughs> this is an awesome place. And I looked at it and I thought, you know, this is the picture of the church's mission right now. You see, the angels are ascending and descending the stairway. What do the angels do? They minister, they serve God, but they also serve the saints of God. <laughs> and I thought, here we are. We're, they're engaged with us in this ministry uh, you know, from earth to heaven, from heaven to earth, completing the two ways, supernatural encounters. This is going on continuously. We're meant to be doing what those angels are doing and they are doing with us. We're meant to be living from heaven to earth and from earth towards heaven because that is hope. And then finally, verses three and four. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden in Christ. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in this glory. Our real life is hidden in Christ. It's hidden. It's concealed. It's kept secret. When you're born again, Ephesians 2 tells us that, you know, our particular destiny on this world is revealed. It's revealed when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to know, you know, perhaps what it is you to give yourselves to in the more detailed sense, as opposed to, you know, I just need to get to know God and to become like uh, Christ. It's revealed to you on that particular occasion. But the big reveal reference here is that of the Christian's infinite hope. See, we're bringing eschatology into this idea of hope. We're talking about when Jesus comes again. And this is what this text is referring to. When Jesus comes again, the whole world will see on that day that Christ's followers were created to share in his glory. Remember you're positioned in heavenly places. You're seated with Christ. And so, you, you know, the sharing of his glory, you know, is now, but it's going to be magnificently opened up to us and experienced when Jesus comes again. We will share in his honor and his renown and in his exalted position. That is mind-boggling. The nature of the benefits and the experiences of that glory are not easy to define. I see so many things on YouTube and books written about, I went to heaven and spent 40 days there and I saw this and I saw that and I saw everything else and there was this and that. Everybody sees something a little bit different or, or something the same. I'm a little skeptic about some of these. I'm not writing them all off. I'm sure there are some that are genuine, but I tell you, hardly any of them and even the visitations to hell are not scriptural. They don't measure up. 
And why I'm a little cynical around them is because I know Paul ascended to the third heaven and he saw things that were too wonderful to describe. He didn't have the words to articulate them. That, you know, it was an ineffable experience. And then he was permitted from sharing from some things. And then God gave him a thorn in the flesh just so that he wouldn't you know, think of himself as being highly exalted out of the privilege of that experience. And yet these people say they go to heaven and what do they do? They get on television and write a book and make money out of it. <laughs> Where's the humility there? Anyway, I ramble. <laughs> but here's the thing, you see. The nature and benefits are not easy to find because 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, this is Paul again, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. It is going to be out of this world. You can't even articulate it. You can't even imagine it. You, you imagine the most wonderful, beautiful thing that you might desire to experience. It's going to be even far greater than that. You just can't pick it, says God. It's going to be so incredibly awesome. And you're having a tough time now? Think about what's coming. <laughs> so the detail of the benefits is not clear, but the role is. The role is clear. 2 Timothy uh, uh, 2, verses 11 and 13, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, endure hardship now, we will reign with him then. Isn't that good? Endure hardship now, reign with him then. I love it. So here's it. This is, this is the hope. Who, who would like to be a king? Or a queen? I'd like to be king. Um, <laughs> we are destined to reign with Christ. In the new heavens and in the new earth, we're destined to reign with him. You've got no idea what that means. Cities to rule over, planets to rule I, I don't know. But you're going to rule, and in the literal sense at that time, you will be seated with Christ in heavenly places. Pastor Judy talked about man being made a little less than angels. You know, when that time comes, you will judge angels. We will sit on thrones alongside our Savior and enjoy by grace what is His by right. And this is it, though. The extent of that authority, the extent of that rule will be determined by your priorities now. Whether you live for heaven rather than earth, it'll be determined by how you serve and how you love. At the beginning of Colossians, before writing about this coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul refers to it. He says, look, this is your confident hope. He says, what God has reserved for you in heaven. Think about that. He says, you've had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the gospel news. Our expectation, the infinite hope of the sharing in Christ's exalted position. That's what gets us through this world. That hope which is to come, which transfers into hope now. So it doesn't matter what you're going through. You're going to get through. <laughs> That's the hope that God has for you. He'll do it miraculously. He'll just give you the strength to get through and grow something and build something through that experience, which will increasingly transform you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ in preparation for what is to come. You see, everything that's happening here is preparation for what's to come. Even the intermediary heaven that we go to if we were to die will be a continuation of the preparation for what is to come for the time when you are to rule and you are to reign. That's how infinite hope. You know, my little grandson, it was wonderful because, you know, I've been praying for him and we went out and we had a, uh, he had a nice coffee. I had a coffee uh, the other day, met him after school. And uh, I'm sitting with him and I said, well, Ashton, everybody's praying for you. I'm praying for you. And uh, he says, yes, granddad, and I'm praying too. He says, I just want this gone. And I said, well, God can do that. And we're praying for healing. We'll just keep, we'll just keep going. And he said to me, because he, you know, by circumstances, hadn't been able to be back to church. And, and I've been concerned about that. And he says to me, you know, granddad, just the other night, he said, I... He said, I prayed and I, and I asked Jesus to really come into my heart again. This is my 12-year-old grandson, you know. Usually we just talk about computer games and, you know, 
things like that, and can we go to McDonald's? You know, it's just kind of that, that kind of, this is deep, this deep conversation. He's, and and I, I'm just, I'm oh God, thank you. Because I want him to have God in this journey. And he says, yeah, he says, it was so funny. He said, it was so weird. And I said, will you tell me about it? Because I told him about, I, I told him how I received Jesus and my experiences. And he says, he said, well, after I did that, I said, me and dad, we, we went out and we're driving down the road. And he says, I saw this sign, a lit up sign in somebody's front yard. It was a cross and it said, Jesus loves you. And he says, I felt that Jesus was speaking to me. And I says, he was, he was. So I'm praying for him and he's praying for him and everybody's praying for him because we have hope in this life. But you know, it doesn't matter how it turns out, we still have hope. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I'm not doing this life without him, without Jesus. Amen? Amen. Oh, I don't know how people are doing it. Chasing the wind. <laughs> Chasing the wind. <laughs> looking for something they'll never find. The answers in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ come down from heaven for the salvation of souls. Amen.